Hello. Just a quick uh, survey before I start talking. Who here is a programmer? <laughs> Who here is interested in learning to program? Excellent, there'll probably be more useful advice in here for you. Anyway, hello, my name is Tef, and I am a really terrible programmer. I started programming to find out how things work. I started taking things apart. When I was actually two, I took apart the household phone with a screwdriver. Uh, the third time, my parents couldn't back, uh, put it back together. I kept taking things apart to find how they work, and now after more than a decade in the industry, I'm constantly surprised that things actually do work. I am a really bad programmer. I write bugs. I forget to write tests. I write documentation that isn't really in English. And in a code review, I am the most apologetic person you will ever see, which for some of the people in the audience may come as quite a surprise. But frankly, I know we can do better. That's your optimism quotient for the talk. <laughs> anyway, I'm here to talk to you about mistakes I've made, mistakes other people have made, and how we can learn from them. Really, I'm kind of talking about the people in the industry and the practices in the industry rather than the code that we write. I'm not going to sit and talk to you about all of the bits and bytes involved or get into hideous technical detail. Or at least I'm going to try not to get into hideous technical detail. But really, the standard disclaimer applies. This is my opinion. It doesn't re uh, reflect my work, my friends, my lifestyle choices or anything else. Or reality. <laughs> now, some people have found my opinions useful, but personally I've only found them actually get me into trouble. I'm actually quite wrong about programming a lot, but frankly it's never stopped anybody else writing about it on the internet. So uh, that's a perfectly good place to start, people who are wrong on the internet. Now, there is this constant theme in programming where people try to divide the world into good versus evil, or good versus bad to get, uh, give it a less political name. Now, when people talk about good and bad programmers, what they normally mean is this. <laughs> the insinuation is, if you make all the mistakes they made and cargo cult their personality, you will be as successful as they will be. Sometimes, it's a little bit more veiled. Now, a noted programmer who likes to call this the blub paradox. Has anybody heard of the blub paradox? Basically, it's a smug Lisp user. I won't call him out by name. But he made his money selling an unmaintainable Lisp program to Yahoo. So unmaintainable that they replaced it with Perl. They, they could not find anyone smart enough to understand the hideous mess that he had wrecked. And uh, in learning from selling all of this stuff, uh, his stuff off, he decided to write an essay called The Blub Paradox about anybody else who didn't understand how clever he was being wasn't as good a programmer as he was. He also claimed that uh, if people understood Lisp, they would have prevented September 11, 2001. This is actually on his website. He doesn't link it anywhere because he feels some shame, but it's still there. <laughs> The next one is a more recent one. Somebody decided the best way to explain programming was in terms of politics. <laughs> now, if you've ever talked to a programmer, they like using accurate terms. So what he decided to do is go, programmers who like these languages are liberal, and programmers who like these languages are conservative, and as a software liberal, I think this one's right. So what he actually managed to do, which is an amazing thing for a blogger, which was actually drag down conversation, prevent any intelligent discussion, and now people are happily posting on the internet going, I'm a software libertarian. <laughs> Why do people do this? Why do people feel the need to divide the world into good and evil? There are two reasons. Everyone loves a simple answer to a hard question, especially a wrong answer. <laughs> And people love blog hits. <laughs> it's been well known in tech journalism for years that the best way to get page views is not to say anything informative or right or informed. It's to troll people. <laughs> and that's exactly what he's done. 
Now, to just go on to an aside, there are many asides in this talk. I make no apologies. How many of you heard the myth of the genius programmer, or that some programmers are 10, 50, 100, a million times better than other programmers? How many of you know where that comes from? Haha. -ha. Somebody's watched a talk I linked on my Twitter feed. Right. This came from a study in 1960 about batch processing versus interactive processing with 12 people in an afternoon. And since that day, everybody has repeated the myth that there are fantastic programmers, somehow geniuses that can reach out and create wonderful worlds. But honestly, after working in the industry for a while, I don't really believe it's true. The people who sort of repeat this myth are the ones who sort of go, I have nothing left to learn because I'm fantastic. Some of the other people repeat this myth as if to go, I can't do this, this is, uh, it's too hard. All this myth does is prevent people from learning and like trying to grow as people and try to learn and understand things. It's a constant excuse for ignorance on both sides. Really, when you ever hear the term a genius programmer, sometimes it's called a rock star or a ninja, a founder, an entrepreneur. What they mean is someone who's willing to work 80 hours a week and only get paid for 20 of them. <coughs> this is another common myth in programming. For some reason, people think owning a penis means that they understand computers. It's terrible. If you believe this, you're not only a terrible programmer, you are likely a terrible person too. <laughs> if anybody wants to take me up on an argument about this afterwards, I'll fucking have you. <laughs> I'm really hoping once we can sort the gender divide, the race divide in programming, we can move on to more important issues closer to my heart, like tabs versus spaces, but <laughs> I don't actually have a lot of hope. <laughs> there was actually a study done. They divided people into two groups, one of which was told, gender has a difference in your ability, the other one wasn't. In the group that was told gender has a difference, weirdly enough, the gender that was told they are better than the others did slightly better. In the other group, everyone did better. <laughs> everyone. If you believe these sorts of myths, all it is is an excuse. People who go try and find something's too hard, they go, well, obviously, I don't have a penis, I don't understand this. Or they go, I have a penis, thus I've understood everything there has ever needed to be understood in the world. Bad people. <laughs> But frankly, since it's so easy to divide the world into good and bad, I'm going to have a go too. And you can have a go at me for this later. Personally, I'm a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B. Can people read this at the back? Basically, sometimes I refuse to try to learn. And other times I just blatantly refuse. But really, programmers make mistakes all the time. Everyone here has written a bug. Everyone who has ever written a program has written a bug. It's a constant field of mistakes. But the biggest mistake I have ever seen in programming is optimism. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, optimism is necessary if you actually, for a moment, understood the absolute challenge of programming, trying to understand everything that's going on all of the interlinked libraries, all of the operating system calls, you would go mad. Absolutely insane. Optimism is absolutely necessary to do programming, otherwise we would sit and curl up into a small ball drinking whiskey. But you can tell an optimistic programmer, they have this saying, it goes, you would think that. You would think that we'll be able to sort this thing out. You would think that they'd be able to fix this bug. Every time they're being optimistic, they're underestimating the absolute difficulty and treachery of programming in the real world. Don't get me wrong, things could be better. Things could be much better. But we go out of a way to fix bugs, we run tests, hopefully. Um, but really we don't do anything to fix the situations that lead to bugs. We don't go around trying to fix people. Mistakes come from the environment too. 
Really, if we really want to find out why bugs keep happening, we have to fix our processes. We have to fix the mentality that lets us write so many things, rather than accepting it as a gradual inevitability that we are so incapable of our job that we have to spend the next nine months patching things. Really, it's not an endemic problem. It's systematic. Now, code really reflects social structures. Now, this quote comes from a man called Melvin Conway, who published a paper called Conway's Law, or now called Conway's Law. And they thought it was a joke, so they refused to publish it. But he sat and looked at all of the structures of teams writing code. And when you had a four-person team, you got four modules. You can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> eight-person team, eight modules. Frankly, code is a reflection of the personality of the user. Uh, some people might have heard the term of a god object. A god object is uh, an object in a program that seems to handle, handle way more than it should. All of the responsibilities, every single thing that can be done is a method somewhere buried in a 6,000 line program. These, uh, these objects come from godlike programmers, people who believe they are responsible for everything that is going on in the system. A lot of people leave worshippings. They occasionally try and poke it, twist it or otherwise, but they sit and treat it with respect and fear. But as much as I'm picking on individuals making mistakes and the processes that do that, groups make mistakes too. And I'd like to tell you some of my favorite group mistakes. <coughs> Who's heard of bike shedding? Right. This comes from a book called Parkinson's Law. He argued that if you were trying to build a nuclear power plant, what would happen is you sat and talked about the cooling systems and various other bits and pieces. Everybody would be silent around the meeting. They didn't know what they were talking about, so they'd be quiet. But there was a bike shed at the nuclear power plant, and everybody wanted to know which colour to paint it. Suddenly, the meeting room erupted. Everybody had their favourite colour and preferences. Quit essentially, when there's no domain experience, there's no actual knowledge involved in the decision, everyone can contribute, and everyone will whether you like it or not, and they won't shut up about it. Quite essentially, everybody wants to feel part of the process, want to feel they're making part of the decisions, and they will happily try to stick their thumb, well, it's a Danish saying, sticking their thumbprint on things. So, when you lower the barrier to entry, you realise that all you're going to do is waste everyone's time somewhat, because everyone has a favourite colour, and no amount of argument can solve it. Another favorite of mine is called the group project. In a group project, a bunch of enthusiastic people go together and go, if only we all got together, if only we all tried to do something together, we could make something awesome. I've got a list of ideas I didn't find interesting enough to do on my own, but maybe some of you guys will really like them. <laughs> the reality is collaboration requires leading by example. And by example, I don't mean being someone with lots of ideas. I mean someone who actually enacts on their ideas and actually tries to get stuff done. If you're really enthusiastic about a project, if you've seen around here, people will come up and help out. On the other hand, if you stand on stage and go, I've got the best idea in the world, people will sort of troll you from the back rows. Really, people have this idea that ideas are golden, ideas are perfect, ideas will save you from every type of hard work in the world. But ideas are multipliers for effort. Even the worst idea in the world can still make money if you put enough time into it. But really, if ideas are all you have, you're an idea guy. <laughs> now, if you have a group project and all the people in there have ideas, now, a forum I'm on calls this Goon Projects. What happens is people go, I like video games. I'm really good at playing video games. I have this awesome idea for a video games. I just need someone to write the game, draw the art, and build the game, but I have ideas. I can totally contribute. It's a bit like somebody going up to you and going, I've got this great idea for a book, all I need is a writer, and you'll get a share of the royalties. <laughs> you can tell these ones because all of the discussion revolves around almost one of two things. The name and the logo. <laughs> Most recently, there's been attempts to build dark nets or distributed social networking. There's a Reddit project set up called Darknet Plan. They finally banned threads about the name and the logo because that's all that was getting discussed. People who come up to you and go, I really like your project, I really want to contribute, I've got an idea for it, uh, I'll set up the wiki, I'll set up the press camp. 
They're not going to help anything. I'm sorry. Another classic idea is Waterfall. Uh, I assume some of you have heard of the Waterfall development process? Who know, uh, hands up of you who have read Royce's original paper on Waterfall. Well, that one person over there will know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Waterfall was a straw man argument. On the first page of the paper we went, here is a system that doesn't work. But it turns out, when you put a really nice picture on the front page of your paper, that's as much as people will read. <laughs> he then went on and elaborated how you need feedback through the various parts and how things have to, you know, react to change. And it's one of the most terrible things that we do in software engineering at the moment. Project management is almost like an attempt to control reality rather than measure it or even have any idea of feedback. I'm sure many of you have experienced milestones upon high handed down. Uh, I have a number of times and I'm very bitter at that. Anyway. <laughs> but really there's this mentality with Waterfall that this time we'll do it perfectly. This time everything will go right. We don't need to have any slack. Nothing will go wrong. Ah. Waterfall, have you ever seen the cartoon about birds in a tree? The birds at the bottom of the tree get covered in shit and when they look up all they see is assholes. That's basically what Waterfall is. It's the idea... It's the idea that you get all of the design, all of the, the slack, all of the anticipation of things that will go wrong months and years down the line, in three months, and then if they happen further down the line, that's their problem. So you'll get designs that don't work, constraints that don't work, and it's your fault and you have to clean up after the mess. Um, this often re uh, ends up in crunch time. It turns out we don't need to do risk management. We don't need to worry about Slack because we'll just make the programmers work for 80 hours a week. That's all they're good for. Does everybody understand Waterfall now? <laughs> But really, it's not just people, practices, methodologies, companies. We also don't know how to find good programmers or reward good programmers. Now, how many of you heard of brain teasers and interview questions? Do you know what you should do in an interview when somebody comes up to you and says, why are manhole covers round? Leave. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many of you heard of the Watson selection task? The Watson selection task is you get four cards on a table, two are face up, two are face down, one's red, one's black, and there's a, a pattern back and a plain back one. And you ask people, how many cards do I have to turn over to check every card is red? And when you ask it like this, people often say three, because they're not checking for contrapositives. Now, I don't really want to go into this complete cog sci thing, but it turns out that when you ask in instead, and I'll, let me rephrase the question, you have four people, two are over age, two you haven't checked the age at all, one's drunk, one isn't. How many people do you have to check to see that you're not breaking the law? When you phrase these questions in a social context, everybody gets it right. When you ask it in an abstract context, no one gets it right. Domain experience is absolutely vital for problem solving. Really, when somebody is asking you a brain teaser question, what they're trying to do is prepare you for terrible management. They're trying to say, I've heard people excuse this and say, well, I know we're not hiring for a quiz show host, but the management like to ask really arbitrary and stupid questions all the time, so that's what we do in the interview <laughs> to filter out the same ones. And some other people go, I heard Facebook does it. Google does it. Microsoft does it. That's bullshit. You read it in a tech journalism article. The same article has been going around for years. All that happens is the, the company that's in the light of the world, they do a search and replace with Google and put in Facebook. But I don't really want to argue about tech journalism. That's an entirely another talk. But frankly... <laughs> But frankly, if you find a company asking brain teasers, it's a really good sign that the job is terrible and you should leave for your own sanity. I've made this mistake countless times and I don't want to see anyone else do this.
Really, we like to call ourselves a science, computer science, but we don't really test our assumptions, or our code, or our methodologies, <laughs> or really anything that we do. We have rituals, cargo culting. We have things called best practices that kind of amount to superstition. You'll still get people going, oh, I don't like garbage collection because my lecturer who works on punch cards thinks it's evil. <laughs> We go around teaching people to create from the top down, writing every program as if it will be perfect once. And four years in university, I was never asked to maintain a program, fix a program, document a program, test a program, and it's very rare that these things happen in practice. But then, unfortunately, if you actually get a job programming, that's all you will ever be doing. For some reason, we have this idea, almost like pyramid builders, that we're building this gigantic obelisk that will stand for thousands and thousands of years. I'll apologise to the embedded programmers in the audience because those things are kind of true. <laughs> but for the rest of you who are writing web apps or skins around databases as I like to call them, <laughs> almost all of the work you are doing is talking to other programmers, finding out what's going on, reading code, not writing it. Now, I don't mean to go off and like have a go at prototyping or experimental coding. Experimental coding is fantastic. It helps you go off and understand the problem, fix it in your own head. But when I've written prototypes, almost everything I've learned has been from pushing it into production and then fixing all of the really stupid ideas I came up with in the first week. <laughs> but to move on again, <coughs> I've talked about a number of bad things in programming, but I haven't mentioned the next one. Teaching. Well, I kind of have, but hey. Really, there are two driving factors in how we teach programming. One of which is nostalgia, and the other of which is how the teacher learns best. Do what I do, fail like I did, and you will be as successful as I have been. <laughs> there isn't any appreciation of learning preferences. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had uh, dyslexic problems or gone to learning support, but there's this idea called the VARC test. Visual, audio, reading, and kinesthetic. If I ask you for directions, some people will tell me, some people will draw me a map, some people will walk me there, and some people will write down detailed lists of expressions. Not everybody learns in the same way, not everybody uh, teaches in the same way, but for some reason we think that the only way to teach is how they learn. I'm, any of you who have been to university, you must have seen a university lecturer, the, the kind that will read his printed notes out. And they're not just doing it in the hope that everybody leaves and they can go back to the staff room and like, drink tea. They're doing that because that's how they learned. Really, what we want to do is encourage people to learn rather than dictating their learning course to them. A vital skill in programming in the real world is Googling, looking things up on your own, throwing, being thrown into the deep end. But we don't really encourage that. We kind of go, here are your learning outcomes, tick the boxes and you're done. In fact, when I was at university, I had to sit in a tutorial class and the tutor finally gave up trying to explain anything that was going on. And for the last tutorial lesson, all we did was chant. He told us to chant public, static, void, main. He'd given hope, given up absolute hope of trying to get us to understand, trying to be engaged, trying to learn, or trying, even being enthusiastic. The only thing that would save his face was everyone getting at least one mark in the exam. You can see the difference between like adult education and child education. Adult education, if people don't like it, they leave. In child education, if people don't like it, we send the police around. Really, there's a sort of lack of respect for learners. There's this whole sort of, I know best. Personally, I've learned the most that I have about programming from sitting down with somebody else who asks the most amazing questions and I have to think about what I'm doing. I haven't learned anything from being on my own or just assuming that I know everything from the beginning. So really, if somebody asks me, I want to learn how to program, my first question, and it should be a question that you ask rather than telling them straight off, is what do you want to create? What do you want to build? So just on a bit of uh, random unsolicited advice, if you do want to learn programming, find the languages and the tools that your friends use, because otherwise you're going to be screwed when you need help. 
Find something that's easy to install. Find something that doesn't require going through a 300 page manual on how to open a certain dialog box and navigate through the menus. It's just not fun. Don't worry about object orientation, functional programming, and all of the crazy things that some of your friends with weird hair are talking about. <laughs> really, learning to program should be about play. It should be getting things up and running in an afternoon and seeing what happens. It should really just be about poking things and uh, hopefully not crushing your computer. Learning programming shouldn't be the means to an end. It should be something you're doing in order to do something actually fun. Now, I've touched on the idea of learning through play, but what I like to suggest is people, they get a sandbox environment. They find, like, have you, has anybody ever used Logo or a Turtle Graphics? Yeah. Keep your hand up if that was the first language you ever started. Yeah, yeah that's why you're stuck with it. <laughs> that's why you've never escaped programming. It was so much fun in the beginning and you've been trying to find and recapture that ever since. <laughs> I know I have. Now, I am recommending all of these things and I talked about how nostalgia and learning styles kind of dictated how people teach and I am totally guilty of this because my first language was Logo 2. Logo was introduced by Seymour Papert in a book called, well, he wrote about it in a book called Mindstorms. If you're wondering, the Lego set is named after the book, not the other way around. One of the biggest ideas that Mindstorms elaborates is this idea of the math world. This idea of an environment in which the person at the front of the computer can dictate the terms, dictate the rules, dictate how things happen. Uh, a beautiful story was someone who was having trouble writing English, having trouble getting all the, the verbs to match, the tenses to match, was asked to write a poetry generator. And as they sat trying to encode the rules of grammar, a very simplistic grammar, I'm not suggesting anybody try to encode the rules of English grammar and programming, I don't want anybody else to go mad. But as they sat and did this, they suddenly clicked because they'd suddenly found a way to formalize, to sort of internalize the rules of the thing that they were doing. It was no longer a black box, a thing that mysterious things happened and stuff came out the other end. They could actually see the effects of the changes they made and it helped them learn. Uh, Piaget and constructivist learning, if only you want to Google this later, it's totally awesome. There's a similar idea that's been espoused in math education. Now, a lot of math education is basically treated as a death march through formula. They call it problem solving, but really what they mean is find that bit of the book where we told you how to solve this problem exactly and then write it down on the piece of paper. Instead, they argue that you should teach maths by asking people how do we measure the, the if you have a box, and you want to know the volume, you ask the children, how do we measure the volume? And they all come up with ideas all on their own, as if by magic. It's almost as if they're like enthusiastic before school crushes it from them. <laughs> but really, the moral is here that learning is fun. Learning is absolutely fun, but only when you get to be creative about it, only when you get to set your own terms, dictate your own rules, and get to explore without just having to go through a checkbox of learning outcomes. The other biggest influence in how I learn programming, now some of you have ever heard of ViewSource. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, I learned to program on the web early and I would find something interesting. I would right click and go view source. And at that time, JavaScript minimizers weren't popular, so you'd actually see code and sometimes people would write comments explaining what they would do. And you had a working program and then you could tweak it and change it and play with it and find something new. There wasn't this, uh, I'm going to repeat myself, a black box. Uh, suddenly I was free to explore and engage with the environment. I missed that. Now, I don't mean to go back to internet bloggers, but another internet blogger recently wrote an article called Why are you learning programming for fun? Don't you realize programming is serious business? How dare the mayor of New York go out and learn programming? There's so many things to learn and so many things to do. It's like, maybe it was fun for them. Maybe they're enjoying themselves, and maybe that's actually how you got into it in the first place, you hypocritical bastard. <laughs> but frankly, that's Jeff Atwood. I have many other opinions about Jeff Atwood. None of them are flattering. <laughs> how many of them are fit for public consumption? <laughs> in summary, he is a terrible person. Okay, I'll tell you a little story about Jeff Atwood. <laughs> Jeff Atwood wrote on his blog and saying, 
I'm writing a website and the business use case is filtering HTML and I must understand this in order to run a successful website. There are libraries uh, written by people who understand HTML and parsing and all of the other bits involved. But if I used a library for my code, I wouldn't be doing my core business practice of rewriting strings. So he published his algorithm and people broke it, and published it again and people broke it. And then after a month of everybody telling him to do it the way that all of the libraries already do, he kind of grudgingly took their advice. And now what he says is, now I've gone through this learning experience, none of you have to do it. You can all use my library. You don't have to go and do this in the first place. With no hint of irony. He is a terrible programmer. But really, if you're going to tell people off for learning and playing and exploring, you're a bad person and I hate you. <laughs> now, <laughs> kind of touch on misogyny before, this is just kind of a jokey title. Now, some people say you have to learn C. C is a real language, it's used everywhere. Real man use bullet <laughs> Real man eat quiche. The thing is about C, it's actually quite hard. It's actually quite old. There's a lot of things that you need to do to get it to up, to get up and running. I've seen so many embedded programmers going, oh my god, why do I have to include files? What the fuck is this all about? Really, when you're trying to learn to program, you want to get something up and running, not in an afternoon, not in an hour. You want something up and running now. C is not the language to do this. Now, once you've become comfortable with the shell, become comfortable with an editor, become comfortable with the idea that you run, it crashes, you go and try and fix the problem, you cry a bit. Once you've come to terms with how terrible programming is, C is a perfectly acceptable second language. But frankly, forcing it down beginners' throats is just going to scare people off from the outset. Although, admittedly, I'm pretty sure that's what this talk is doing from the C is character building. <laughs> now, other people will tell you that you need to use what's used in industry. Now, I'm not saying that you need to go out and use these uh, Scratch or various other things and they're bad. They're, they're actually quite fun. But some people will say, oh, you must learn Java because you want a job in programming. You don't want a job in programming. <laughs> now, the thing is about object orientation is we only developed it in about, well, actually we developed it in 1964, but... Um, We've only come to terms with how useful it is in certain places after we've actually written large enough programs to benefit from them. Now, I mentioned before about chanting public static void main. This is what happens when you try and teach object orientation first. You spend the first hour explaining everything that they have to ignore in order to get the thing working. Now, I don't know about you, but teaching people the first lesson of ignore this, ignore this, don't ask questions about this, this is too hard, doesn't sound like a really good way to encourage people to be exploratory and creative. Again, it's a better second language, not a first, but uh, maybe third, fourth, fifth, somewhere down the line. Now, a lot of people, when they're learning, they look for ways to avoid learning. Uh, some of you who hang around on forums on the internet where people are asking questions will go, I want to know if this will work, this three-line program, and I'm too afraid to run it and see what happens, so I'm looking for some reassurance. <laughs> this is a direct effect of this overcomplication of learning. Really, people learn with a view of trying to avoid as much work as possible, trying to cut their losses, because some things that you want to learn are just really, really, really hard, and it will take many, many years of your life. So... I don't think we should be teaching complicated languages. I don't think we should be teaching languages that demand that you ignore things because all it will do is encourage people to ignore things in future and write comments on random people's blogs going, please, can you send me the code? Now, another thing about learning programming is some people are like, programming is mathematics, so you must understand group theory, algebraic geometry, and differential geometry. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong, maths is important to programming. Maths is very important to programming because like, uh, there's things like floating point, also known as the incredibly misleading numbers that never really work the way that you want them to. <laughs> the thing is, not many programs actually demand that much mathematics beyond counting. If you can use a spreadsheet, you already know pretty much every single piece of mathematics you will ever need to know in programming in the real world. 
programming is part mathematical, but it's not going to be like cryptology or differential geometry. But there's the same sort of uh, reasoning behind it. There's the same sort of working things through. <clears throat> what I'm really trying to say here is not that programmers should be mathematicians, but programmers are mathematicians. And if you disagree with me, there's a big, big paper called the Curry-Howard Isomorphism that says that proofs are programs. But you can look that up when you go home. But ultimately, programming is not just one thing. It's an interdisciplinary thing. You need to be able to write in your native language. You need to be able to have critical reasoning. You need to have engineering discipline, and you need to have that whole sort of mathematical reasoning as well. But the most overlooked skill in programming is understanding the domain of the problem that you're actually solving in the first place. <laughs> Now, as I slowly get to the end of my talk, I thought I'd share some tips on how to be a successful programmer. But as I said in the beginning, I'm a terrible programmer. I burn out in jobs, I go mad, I drink too much, etc. But other people seem to get along really well in programming, and I've sat and watched them, so I thought I'd share some of the ways in which they do this. Don't write documentation. Documentation means you're replaceable. <laughs> If you fix a bug, make sure it fixes only that case that they've talked about so that somebody else can reopen the bug later. <laughs> the standard library is evil. Don't use things other people understand. The best code is the one that you've written yourself. Go crazy with advanced features. Object orientation is not crazy enough. The type signature of your function should be at least 60 pages long. I had a boss who was a PhD. I shouldn't be mentioning about this because it's being recorded, but... <laughs> the thing is, whenever he wrote a program, it wasn't to solve the problem, it was to demonstrate how smarter he was than everyone else in the room. Every single feature was in a different file. And it was fine for him, he could keep all of this complexity in his head. I'm really terrible, I'm really stupid, I can't keep any of this complexity in my head whatsoever. And I constantly struggled to do any of the things they were doing. Eventually I caught up and I realised that the entire program was stupid from the outset. So. Uh, but uh, that's another story entirely. But really, uh, you, you want to use an abstraction, modules, especially if you have to use all the modules together in some weird, awkward incantation to actually get them to work. That works wonders. Um, at a previous com uh, company, we had a term called Andre Bugs. Um, now, I'm not going to name the company. I, I might if you goad me. What we did was we, uh, we did flight prices, and uh, we had to get child prices for flights. And so what he did is he hard-coded the, the percentage of an adult flight that would be for the child price. And so somebody would open a bug saying, this flight is wrong. So he'd change the percentage, close the bug. <laughs> and then two days later, someone else would open a new bug saying, this different airline, from a different person, this is also wrong. So he'd change the percentage, you can close it. And what management saw was all of these bugs being filed and closed within five minutes. He is the most productive programmer they have ever seen. <laughs> Don't forget the useful things like non-deterministic tests, tests that never pass unless you kind of stand on one leg and sort of sacrifice a chicken. <laughs> Remember, if it takes at least a week to get all the stuff installed on your machine, that's perfect because no one ever can keep up to what you're doing. But ultimately, being a successful programmer is being a solipsist, pretending there are no other people in your team and you're the only hero that can save the world. But ultimately, if you sabotage your company, you will be rewarded. <laughs> the only time I was actually praised at this job was when I stopped working for two weeks and I decided to play something called the CC game. Every time you get an email, you reply to it and add someone else in the company. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, copy and paste emails from someone else into the new email, but make sure it's in a Word document. <laughs> Using the company's formatting, they love that. If you're wondering when you win, it's when the CTO is finally on the end of the email chain and he calls a meeting. And the person who actually raised the bug gives up, throws his hands up in disgust and refuses to talk to anybody anymore. But ultimately, you need to create work for yourself that only you can do and that's how you will be successful. On the other hand, if you want to be a good programmer, the best way to be a good programmer is try to get fired as soon as possible. <laughs> You need to stop trying to write code, and you need to try to read code. Now, can you imagine if you were trying to talk to uh, an author who writes books? 
and you went to their house and it was barren and the only books on the shelf were the ones that they had written and because that was all the experience that they needed I have been to a sci-fi author's book uh, sci-fi author's flat and it was scary it is the most books I have ever seen in my life I feared for my life because they would just fall over if you breathed in the wrong place but frankly we sit and pride ourselves on all the things that we've created rather than all of the things that we've learnt from there's another sort of adage to that, in that often I've been going through CVs and people write, I have 10 years experience of C++, and you don't see what they've read, what they've done, or what the other, and pretty much all that means is I've done one year 10 times. Now, oh, sorry, my notes are wrong. I'm going to have to improvise now. Now, sometimes people complain that it's really hard to estimate about work and work out what actually needs to be done. But I'm not sure if that's because we're constantly reinventing new stuff or we kind of refuse to read about all of the people who have done it before. Uh, I'm still on the, the fence about that one. But really, what you really want to do is write code as if you're going to get it wrong, as if the, all of the assumptions you've held dear will be absolutely stupid. Write code as if you can delete it tomorrow and replace it, because almost certainly you will have to. This is a lot easier if you don't spend all your time writing lots of code. Empathy is fantastic in programming. We need a hell of a lot more empathy. There's this horrible trend where if you ask a programmer a hard question, they will go, well, we'll put a checkbox in the program and leave it to the user. Also known as, we told them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> But really, you don't want to try and write correct code. You just want to write code that's less painful when you're wrong, and you will be. Really, the moral is you want to write code that's easy to replace, not easy to extend. Anyway, as I slowly wrap up and await the inevitable trolling questions, <laughs> I hope, I have a final warning. Although I've talked about many of the problems in the software industry, programmers, I'm going to repeat that, programmers, because it deserves extra bitterness. <laughs> Management, companies, methodologies, tools, practices. The software industry is terrible, but pretty much every other industry is too. Even if you retrain, you will not be able to escape other people. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, who wants to go there? Any questions? One, two. Um, I know that was kind of uh, shrouded in humour a little bit, but I guess there was a kind of serious point there. Um, do you find that the kind of points you were making, you know, the negative sides of uh, software development apply to younger programmers than they do to people who are a bit more seasoned in the, the field? Actually, I find the inverse. When we uh, tried to do uh, hiring at this uh, company, we hired... Uh, we tried to interview a lecturer on C++ who didn't understand the difference between the stack and the heap. I can't explain that reference, but if you understand C++, that's like, what the fuck are you doing? But frankly, we found that the less qualified, the less trained they were, the less we had to unlearn from them, the less of the assumptions we had to take away. They were actually more willing, more humble, and more, just more open to actually trying to learn new things. On the other hand, when you get a prize-winging graduate in Scotland, <laughs> no names, I actually can't remember his name so I can't shame him, who sat, uh, who doesn't know any sort of even the most trivial thing about the language they wrote their final year project in. Really, I, I, I'm not, okay, I am a dropout, I have an absolute bias towards these things, but frankly I found the less educated people are about programming, the more open they are to actually learning about it in the first place. Next, do you want to pass the mic down? That would be awesome. Yes, about you spoke about education. Speaking to the mic. Is it on? Hello. Can you turn this mic on? Hey. Uh, you spoke about education in the university or school, mm -hmm. uh, but I find there is also an issue with education at workplace. I, I'm struggling with actually new hires or relatively new hires who literally say things like, when asked if you read about this, they say no, but I think. And quite often, naturally, what they think someone else already thought about and 
they didn't come to the same conclusions. So it's 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 a struggle for me. I'm not sure what the question was, so I'll just improvise an answer. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe I'm just channeling my frustration. Um, it's okay, that's what I've been doing for half an hour. I think everybody else is entitled to it. Um, there's often talk about a skills gap in employment, and normally what it means is we don't want to pay for people who know what they're doing. But there's another side of the coin. We want people who know exactly what they're doing from the outset. There is a complete abandonment of apprenticeship and mentoring. So, so much of what I've learned about programming has been done from writing code that other people use and they know where I live. And I live in fear still to this day. But we kind of almost expect everybody to know things absolutely from the outset. So either you need to aim higher or aim lower. You need to either pay more for the people who you actually think will know these things or you need to be willing to spend time to invest in the people and get them to learn. But when you do invest in these people, they're really easily exploitable and they'll happily work for long hours. So it kind of works out in your benefit anyway. Is there another question from the audience? If you want, raise your hands. I promise not to be too mean. Or have I stunned you all into silence? Excellent. Oh, oh, one more. Oh. Uh, this is kind of a hard question to answer, I guess. Oh, I love hard questions. <laughs> where, where would you say the solution is then uh, to these kind of problems? I oh, know it is a big question, uh, but, <laughs> but let me put it this way: the, there's, there's this thing, isn't there? The C pro uh, this, what's it called? The C thing, where they try and get kids to learn programming in schools. Do you think that's a solution? Do you think teaching kids how to manage managers is a better solution? You know. It depends. Um, uh, to give you a simple answer to a hard question, something I called other people out on for earlier, with no shame. Now, the thing is, it's a really hard problem, but that's because it's lots of different interlinked problems. Really, if you give me a more specific example, like uh, I'm young, I'm going to a company, I want to learn things off my own back, sort of thing. It's the Honestly, one of the th uh, I'm not sure exactly what the solution is, but uh, one of the things I think would be better is kind of uh, breaking the whole, for lack of a word, patriarchy in uh, programming. There is so many angry young white men in programming, hi, who basically go around assuming that they know everything. There is a complete lack of uh, diversity. So I think if we get more interesting people with different backgrounds or otherwise, we can start to get along and start to learn from each other a little bit more. But frankly, what we are right now is an entirely a monoculture. Uh, we all go around repeating the same old myths, the same old lies, and uh, back patting, uh, patting ourselves on the back for it. Again, it's a really good question, and I'm sorry I don't have an absolute answer to how everything is terrible and how can I fix it, but it depends on who you are. The, the old cliche of think global, act local. If you're at a company and it's bad, Talk to your managers. If they're terrible, leave. Um, uh, that's very easy for me to say, but there are many, many, many things you can do to fix your environment, but I can't really give you anything other than platitudes in order to do it. Although if you want platitudes, I, 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 I would have more, but I've kind of run out. <laughs> Is there any other questions that are hopefully easy in a single that I can answer in a very trite and simplistic way? <laughs> There's a man at the back. Could you run? To the... oh, oh, actually, let's take a question from the... Frank, we'll just go closest first. Hello. Um, do you think that university is a good way to train programmers then, or do you think people should learn straight out of school? Oh, another hard question. <laughs> oh. Right. Um, one of the things I tried to talk about is how programming shouldn't be a means to an end. We shouldn't be teaching programming. We should, like, there is this whole talk of algorithmic literacy, the idea that uh, programming will become as important as reading and writing to other people. And so I don't think we should be teaching programming in the sense of it stands alone. There's this magical tool that has no uh, means or almost like a completely theoretical subject, almost like pure mathematics. But as you can see with mathematics, it's been branched out to physics, chemistry, sometimes biology. If you're pushing it, statistics. And if you're really pushing it, economics. But uh, I think programming should be actually taught fairly early on just because it's a fantastic tool. Uh, the computer is a gigantic lever of which you can move the world. When I was a kid, I was constantly, uh, the first time I ever saw satellite pictures of my house on the internet, I was amazed. And I'm still constantly amazed at the internet, like watching pictures live from space over an internet link on my mobile phone. 
but really that only happened because no one thought it was interesting enough to put on TV. But I'd say the way in which we're approaching teaching programming is wrong because we're teaching it as a solitary skill, something that only stands on its own rather than programming something that can be so much more useful in other fields to actually achieve really interesting and useful and fun things. Now you can see this in bits like the demo scene, the music hackers, the bioinformaticians, where they're going off and writing very, very simple programs and they all feel really bad about it for some reason. Oh, my totes are terrible. I don't know what I'm doing. Are you solving a problem? Yeah, it's really awesome. Yeah, hey, you're fine. And instead, we celebrate all the people who seem to just write programs for their own sake, programs that are just complex messes or otherwise. I'm not actually sure if that answered your question. I kind of went off of one. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> I guess that'll have to do. Um, there was a question at the back. Do you want to... Uh, thank you for passing the mic back. Um, so I completely agree with your um, point that, you know, it, it's great when um, you when you have a student who, who knows what they want to create and then you give you, you help them find the tools to do that. And I, and I wanted to make a course like that when I was at university for the students. So I, I tried to make a course and I was like, okay, so lesson one in the course, what do you want to make? And they were all like, I, I thought. I thought. Yeah, I don't know. The like is, you tell me, you you tell me what to do. And I, I mean, there are some students who really took that, but the most most of the students were like, no, I, I'm too used to this. You know, maybe they're too used to being just fed it. Basically, education got to them before you could help them to learn. <laughs> um, I don't mean to be bitter about this. My mum was a teacher and she taught me to ask questions, stand up, challenge things, try and learn things, and basically taught me how to get into the most trouble I ever could in my life. <laughs> it's the most awesome thing I ever learned. Now, um, now I talked about earlier about how we want to encourage people to go off and learn, but that isn't to say that we shouldn't provide some support and guidance. Really, there will still be times for a set project, a set things like that, just to get them started, just to get them... Well, the first one is always free, as they say. There is still, you can still provide people a framework for learning without restricting them. You can still encourage people to go off on their own and not dictate their actions, but you can give them a gentle nudge in a direction if they're not really sure what they want to do, especially if they're kind of waiting for the learning outcomes of what they need to learn for the exam. Um, Admittedly, if you want to sit and work on course materials afterwards, I'm probably quite happily to sit and argue with you about everything. But again, to go back to learning preferences, you need to sort of attack learning from all sides. You need to realize that not everybody learns in the same way, not everybody is enthusiastic in the same way, and not everybody really wants the same outcomes from the course. And you can't always ask them because they don't always know. It, it, it is a bit of a very hard thing to put upon the teacher to sort of go, well, you have to sort of encourage them to do it without telling them what to do, except, of course, when you have to tell them what to do. Um, I'm sorry to kind of put that cognitive dissonance on you, but frankly, if you're teaching, you already probably have quite a lot of it already. Either that or you're going to curl up into a ball and cry after I said that. One of you. <laughs> oh, we have a question down the front. Can we pass the mic down? I imagine quite a lot of us learned um, to program originally on 8-bit um, computers, which came, you switched it on and immediately you could start programming. Uh, these days, kids have got consoles and the like, they may have PCs, but I don't think you can get a quick basic immediately um, uh, from, from DOS anymore, for instance. Do you think we've actually made things harder for, uh, for kids to, uh, to learn off their own backs? That's a very good question, although I'm going to do a callback uh, to what I said earlier about nostalgia. It's a very easy thing to go the way in which I learned is a good thing to do, and the, the fun that I had as a kid is the best one. But computers have moved on considerably since the 8-bit, and new opportunities have advanced. Frankly, when people ask me what language should I learn, I tell them JavaScript, because they already have something that runs it. And the best thing is, is they can stick it on a web page and share it with their friends and show off instantaneously. When I was a kid writing an 8-bit program, I had to drag them around to my house or copy it onto a floppy and hope that it didn't break along the way. But now I can kind of write a little tiny program and share it with people all around the world and see what I'm doing. So instead of trying to look back to how things worked and how they were awesome, I think we should try and look to how we can take advantage of the new technologies and bits and pieces. 
almost all of those kids may not have access to a BBC model M, but they do have a phone in their pocket with a web browser that runs JavaScript and can do amazing things. So I'm not going to say it's got worse, but I will say it's got different. The goalposts have moved and kind of looking back with a sort of heady nostalgia, admittedly I did that earlier with Logo, but I, well, I actually, on Logo, I did write a Logo interpreter in JavaScript and put it online, and every so often I abandoned it two years ago, and every so often I go back and look through the gallery and see what people have been creating, and I am somewhere between shocked, horrified, and absolutely surprised. Sometimes people draw swastikas, sometimes people draw giant cocks, other times people have found out how to draw houses or spell out their name and various other bits and pieces, but as I look through all of these uh, crap drawings, I know they've been having fun, and they've been playing, and they've been enjoying, and uh, maybe I've sucked them into the mistakes that I have made. So, I guess to answer your question, or although I'm pretty sure I've answered it through, uh, probably repeating myself now, we need to take advantage of the new technologies rather than just simply looking back to the past. We can still get the instant on environment, we still can do those things. There's things like Squeak, there's things like uh, Scratch, there's things like Alice. There are lots of environments for people to play and explore that are actually very accessible. And we shouldn't be trying to go, well, the only way in which you can learn is on an embedded computer. Because when you put it like that, it does really sound like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> I hope that answers your question without being completely insulted. No, no, you, uh, I completely thought about JavaScript, you're right. Okay. Um, is there any more questions? Oh, we've got a question down the front. Could we pass down the mic and hopefully it will be turned off? Hello. Hello. Uh, We're standing a foot from each, almost a meter or two I'll from each other. Stand up close to face if you like. All right. Hello there. <laughs> let's, not get, let's not get the mics too close together. Right. Picking up on your theme of embracing the new, um, why do we need to teach people to program at all? Why don't we just give them a Stack Exchange login? Because that's teaching them to Google for answers to industry questions rather than teaching them to program. Stack Exchange is the most awesome thing in the world because people no longer have to go to expertsexchange.com <laughs> to find out why their undocumented Java library which their boss has forced upon them isn't working. Uh, Stack Exchange, have you ever, has anybody ever heard of the term the XY problem? The XY problem is this. How do I get the last three characters of a file name? What are you actually trying to do? I'm trying to get the extension. Extensions aren't always three characters. You actually want this sort of thing. The XY problem is basically that people ask questions in terms of the solution they understand rather than the problem. And people will ask questions on Stack Exchange in terms of, I've come up against a brick wall against, uh, along this really stupid way in which I've been solving the problem. What's the immediate answer I can get to keep going for the next five minutes until something else breaks? There isn't an encouragement on Stack Overflow to actually challenge the person's question as being valid, challenge their actual uh, methodology, their assumptions as being valid, there is just a sort of instant reward for doing this. If you meet somebody with a high Stack Overflow reputation, that means they are probably an excellent copywriter rather than a programmer. The entire reward system is about being first to answer a question, copying and pasting other people's answers and summarizing them rather than actually helping people understand the problem in the first instance. Now. I don't mean, I did mention I hate Jeff Atwood. I hate him with a passion. If he's ever watching this talk, I really do hate you. This isn't a joke. <laughs> Stop writing. <laughs> I am never going to forgive you. You're a terrible person. But I don't think that giving them a series of questions and answers asked by people who don't know what they're doing is going to be a good way to encourage them to learn on their own, experiment on their own, and try out new things. Don't get me wrong, giving them a countless stack of it can help them in certain ways, but I don't think it's going to encourage the right sort of attitude, the right sort of, well, for lack of a better, smaller word, examining contrapositives, challenging their own assumptions, let alone the assumptions of the rest of the world. Is there any more questions? Go on. Hey. Who's Jeff Atwood? Jeff Atwood writes a blog called uh, Coding Horror, where he basically either copy pastes from Wikipedia or books that other people have written, and in between, he tries to solicit his own opinions, which are always terrible. <laughs> Here, look. 
Oh, I'm writing a book about programming. Here's a chair that I like. Oh, isn't it cool? And the only time people actually find his comments insightful is almost always when there's a sentence written at the top and then 15 paragraphs copied pasted from Wikipedia. Uh, Joel Spolsky is also a terrible person. Basically, if you read the book People Wear by Tom DeMarco, you can go back and see that Joel Spolsky is not exactly full of shit, but basically an excellent uh, photocopier of other people's actually intelligent advice. Oh, actually, on Joel Spolsky, he recently wrote a post a year ago saying, do you know what I hate? People who write anecdotes dressed up as information. The people like Malcolm Gladwell who feel the need to tell a story rather than actually help people out. Without any sort of irony, he also wrote a book called GUI Programming, uh, GUIs for Programmers where he talks about, I worked in a bakery. Writing a GUI program is very much like working in a bakery. Let me tell you about this. Fred Brooks is the same. He's written two books, one of which is, so I wrote an operating system. Let me tell you about how everything you're doing is writing an operating system. And uh, so I built a house, which is his most recent one. Let me tell you about how programming is like building a house. We have this terrible, terrible thing of generalization in programming where we find something that works and we will just happily mash it into everything that comes along. It, it's the... The same problem I mentioned earlier about how bringing political philosophies into uh, programming chat kind of destroys everything. People will happily take one thing that works in its domain, throw it away, throw the domain away, and then apply it somewhere else. Well, uh, somebody from Baxter said, finding something that works that is considered so remarkable. Not unless you get it right the first time. Um, uh, J.W. Zebra Rant going, there's nothing worse in life than getting it right the first time because no one will ever believe you. And they will spend all of their time making it wrong repeatedly until they slowly learn the things that you learned in order to come to that decision. That just, well, with that, this sounds like a communication problem. Um, really, we kind of treat programmers as if they're like solifists, as if they're individuals working on their own programs, never having to share. The, the first time people will ever have to look at other people's code is pretty much day one of the job. For four years, all they do is they get people to work on individual projects. In my university, they actually got people to work on a group project, which was known as the hazing. Um, industry loved it. They would say, we love your students, they love your graduates, because they've already been broken by the time they get out of it. I think university group projects teach one lesson, which is never trust anybody. Thank you. Uh, that was a nice ad lib comment from the paranoid in the back. <laughs> Middle. Um, is, uh, is there any more questions that I can kind of like pass off with sort of row wit? Do you have questions? Or are you just like being excited and waving your hands? <laughs> that wasn't a question. Oh, we've got a question over there. Um, you can use the mic if you like, or I'll just repeat back what you said in a way that makes, you know, uh, makes it an easier question to answer. <laughs> What's your feelings on the proliferation of courses, very specialised courses, like learning video game design as opposed to general computing? Well, oh, excellent question. That means I have to think about it before giving you a glib answer. Um, I actually met somebody who's been teaching a video game course, and it turns out in the industry, they, uh, video game courses actually need specialised skills. A lot of the computer science courses teach more general application things. They talk about theory, state machines, various other bits, architecture. They don't teach you how to use uh, OpenGL. They don't teach you how to use OpenAL. They actually require quite a lot of uh, experience and knowledge. And so what they were saying is, we're going to teach these courses so we don't have to spend two years bringing graduates up to scratch to be good games programmers. Now, it does depend on the course. The, the, the lecturer I did meet seemed a very remarkable switched on person. And uh, it turns out that course is actually ridiculously hard. It has an incredibly high fail rate. They've actually gone, we're going to dump you in the deep end on C++ and that's all you're going to do for the next four years. So introducing specialized courses that are actually harder, uh, more demanding. I'm not going to try and do the whole ma uh, machoism thing and say it's a good thing, but it does mean that they're actually trying to rigorously push people into that domain rather than the whole sort of, uh, here, look, use click and play, you're a games developer now. Hooray! That's another good thing. That's another good thing. As an undergraduate, uh, if you don't know... If you want to work in a job with no holidays, no prospects of life, and you want to sit and watch your ideas tortured constantly, then you are welcome to go into game programming and design. I'm sorry. Uh, but... I think actually it's showing the maturity of computer science that we're actually starting to have more 
specialist courses around that we're actually trying to apply it to a certain domain. Unfortunately, the first one is games programming, but there are also things like bioinformatics, for example. There are many other examples that I can't think of right now, but let's just pretend I said them and it gives my point more gravitas. But I don't think specialization is a bad thing, even though somebody says specialization is for insects. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. It does depend on the course. I wouldn't judge a game programming course just by its title alone. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my talk. The next talk is waiting to get on, so if you want to pick a fight with me, I'll be outside. Thank you very much. I'm the only 